I am uh, happy to be here, glad to do this. Uh, it's exciting. It's kind of nerve wracking too, you know, uh, being in front of y'all. But uh, anyway, uh, a little on coal rosing. Uh, coal rosing, they believe, started about a thousand years ago, uh, give or take. And uh, it was a way to embellish wooden items, to make them more personal, uh, spoons, cups, bowls, uh, and to beautify them. Uh, people were poor. People had very little. And uh, they took care of what they had. And uh, they wanted to make it pleasing and also to give gifts and to make beautiful items. And uh, coal rosing is the art of incising wood and backfilling it with uh, a pigment. I use uh, black walnut bark. Uh, I uh, use 80 grit sandpaper and make sawdust. And uh, uh, I usually use basswood or mulberry or some other types of woods. But, uh, and it's then smoothing it out and uh, leaving your design in the wood. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really inexpensive way to uh, be in an art form with wood. Uh, coal roasting knives are, uh, uh, here's one here. Uh, this is one uh, that Dell Stubbs made. Here's a little one here, that uh, one that I made. Uh, it, it, it's just, you can carry it in a little package. You can do it anywhere. So it's definitely a uh, uh, easy access folk art. Um, so having said that, uh, there, uh, here's a little video we're going to show you. This is, uh, I made this of a, it's a brooch. It's a picture of a brooch I, I have, and it was found uh, by uh, Bull, Borholm, Denmark. And it's a ride about a thousand years old. It was a Viking dig site. And this is the bottom of a shrink pot. And this just gives you an idea of kind of the lines drawn and uh, how coal rosing works. Go ahead, Josh, you can play her. And there's some oil, just adding some oil to it. I usually use walnut oil, that's my favorite oil, but everybody has different tastes. A lot of people use coffee, but uh, All right, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to be kind of three parts, three segments here. The first is going to be coal rosed items from Vesterheim's collection. Then we're going to have by items of inspiration uh, that hopefully can inspire some type of coal rosing or carving. And then lastly will be my work and I'll be kind of showing you a little piece of my soul. So uh, let's start first, Josh, with the first picture. Okay, this is a, a spoon. It's a fairly simple, a beautiful spoon. Uh, the coal rosing, there's a border around it, that V-shaped pattern. But the artist, uh, I think this is more free form. It isn't a particular type of flower. It's just a beautiful coal rosing image. And uh, they probably just went with their heart and uh, did what they liked. Uh, next. Uh, this is a spoon that the, these are big spoons. This one's probably 14 inches long or so or longer uh, and a big bowl and bowls like this are way easier to coal rose and I don't know if they made the spoon flatter and bigger so they could coal rose it or it's just the way it worked out but uh, there's some flowering around the edge and like I say it's it's a chicken and there was quite a bit of this. Uh, uh, poultry 
on uh, spoons. I've seen this a number of times. Next. Okay, this is a really neat spoon. Uh, could you go to the next one, Josh? Okay, there's the bowl of the spoon. It's a ship. I see there's flags on it. I can't really tell if the one flag is of a country or not, but uh, I'm sure the person who coal rose this, it was probably a gift or they did it while they were on a ship or uh, that that is probably a ship that they knew the name of it and they were aware of it. Uh, these type of items, there's so much history that we'll never know. Uh, there's so much love given between these items to people as gifts, as wedding gifts, as friendship gifts, that when I see these items, I can just imagine and read so much into the history of the item. Next. Oh, this pot. This is kind of a marvel to me. It's a shrink box pot. I think it's about 12 inches tall, maybe a little taller, six or seven around. And... Uh, there's uh, birds on it and flowers. And I've tried to coal rose uh, birch bark and I've had no luck at it. And I was looking at this pot the other day and I think maybe it was bait or they did something to harden the outside of it to where it would take the coal rosing. But I can just imagine when this pot was white and new and they had just done it, it was just spectacular, you know, piece of work. And then you look at how worn it is and how the edges are frayed. Uh, all the people who handled this through the years, the, the, the family that had it, evidently it was pretty important because it survived this long. So uh, it's, it's just a great piece of folk art. Next. Okay, this is a... a a plate, I think Jennifer said this was done uh, in the 80s or 90s. Yeah, it's just, in, uh, 96. 96? Yep. It's just perfect. I mean, uh, I looked at this close and I was amazed at the work and uh, the perfection of it. It's, uh, it's just a beautiful piece of work and uh, I'm going to say flawless. I, I couldn't find an overcut. I couldn't, you know, it was just all there. Next. Okay, this, this spoon's kind of interesting. Uh, it's a cantus, uh, looks like, but what intrigues me is the border around the bowl. You look at the acanthus and it's, it's very well done. And it's very well thought out. And uh, it's centered and it looks great. Then you look at that border. And it, you just wonder, did the same person do both pieces, uh, do, do the artwork? Was uh, the border added later, or was that the first thing that was done, and then somebody else did the, the acanthus? It just, uh, it just interests me because, it, to me, it looks like maybe two different artists or two different people did this bowl. Next. Uh, probably my favorite spoon. Anything you can tell us about this, Jennifer? Or? Yeah, we just we don't have a lot of um, we just don't have a lot of information from you know the family had this piece and that's all that they they really knew about it. But it's based on a um, on a form that you sometimes will find in silver, and um, it's a called a cronache um, because it has this crown. That's Norwegian for crown spoon so it has kind of this crown on the on the top so you'll see this in both wood and in silver so uh does those are sami designs or something similar to them or well, that's, what do that's you, what we that's sort of what we speculate uh since we don't have confirmation but they do align with with some of what we see on other pieces well it's 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 spectacular to me it's only about what four inches long five yeah, it's it's very it's very small, and so it'd be and it's kind of like um, if you hold it with gloves, like we all do, right? When we're going to see them, you would um, it, the the handle is so is so short, and you're almost on the bowl when you when you hold it. Yeah, it's yeah. I imagine that it's so small you could put your hand into a bucket and then take the cream off the top of the 
the pot without, you know, a long spoon. I mean, I just look at it and it, 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 it's a really nice piece. And I, I just love the symbolism on it. Uh, next. Now, now we're getting into politics, I think. The, uh, uh, J Jennifer can, uh, this has something to do with the gold and the silver standard or something. I'll let Jennifer explain it, this a little bit. It does. It's, a, um, it's kind of a lengthy saga in the later um, 18, uh, 1890s for, um, for our country. But anyway, the, um, the U.S. government uh, purchased a, a lot of, of silver and that uh, devalued the um, the dollar and also the gold um, stores, and so there was a lot of um, a lot of activity going on. There was pressure from farmers to do this, pressure from miners to do this, but it ended up uh, with a panic in 1893. And so, in um, at this time period, Grover Cleveland was uh, was president in the 1890s, and um, so he got a lot of flack for, for this when um, he was really trying to fix the problem, but people thought he was really not fixing the problem. So this, was, this uh, spoon was actually made by a Norwegian immigrant who moved to Stoughton, Wisconsin. And we have a number of his pieces, his name's Eric Teigen. And um, uh, so this is just one of his uh, many pieces that we have in the collection. Thank you. Uh the, uh, there's also some artwork on the side, uh, a flower with some vines. Uh, uh, next. Uh, this uh, is the back of the same spoon, so it's just more of the same and uh, with some uh, messages on dollars and what is what. Uh, next. Scott, um, Lisa is wondering if you might be able to comment on what you think these spoons are finished with. You know, I'm, I thought of that, about that, and what, what intrigues me is if you just oiled them, it's almost, I, I wonder if when they were made, were they sealed and varnished or whatever the sealing was, then coal roast and then resealed, because that's what it, uh, I don't, I've never tried that. Maybe Liesl has, but. Uh, I don't know if that's a possibility or not, because to me, this is like almost a, I hate to use it, but varnish of some kind. Uh, 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 and uh, maybe, yeah, that's all I can say. It's, I've seen this a lot in those spoons, and it, it intrigues me that uh, how they kept their design on it for so long it had to be lacquered over top of it to protect it some way. Yeah, Lisa just said that a lot of her old spoons look like they have varnish on them. Okay, yeah, that. Next. Oh, this is a cool spoon. Uh, there's a, looks like two men and a woman coal roast in the bowl. Uh, there's a little message around the bottom that we really can't make out, but it has something to do with this family, and uh, it's been heavily used. Uh, it's chip carved and coal roast. Uh, it, it was probably a, uh, a gift of uh, endearment, of love, and it represents a family. It just, uh, it's kind of all of what folk art's about. It's, it's just, just a really nice piece. Next. Yeah, this, this is interesting. I, I, I put this one in there to kind of show you what your pigment can do. Uh, I don't know what they used on this spoon to darken it, the, the coal rosing, but the spoon either wasn't burnished, which is taking something hard and, and smashing the wood grain down or sanded, but the, the wood soaked in a lot of the pigment. And you can do this on purpose and, or you can, it can be your friend or it can be your enemy, just depends what you want to do. And this just an example of what that dust and that powder you put on it can do, a, especially on the end grain, down towards the bottom of the spoon, where it can hit the end of the grain, it really soaks in the, the, uh, the pigment, so, or the dust. Next. Uh, another 
another spoon I, I really like. Uh, I look at this spoon and I think, uh, well, I have a spoon and I'm just going to start coal rosin on it. And uh, that's kind of the way I do stuff a lot of times. And uh, it looks to me like they coal rose the border around the bowl and then they just uh, started coal rosin. And, and I believe it's probably in a cantus leaf or a leaf of some kind. And I really don't know what the, the piece in the towards a handle on the bowl means, but uh, I just, it's not too full. It's just about right. And uh, it, it's just beautiful because they, uh, they just coal roasted. it. They had something they wanted to decorate and they decorated it. And uh, uh, as most of us would do, you know, uh, full cart was kind of that way. Next. Okay. Probably can't say enough about this spoon. Uh, it's Judy Ritger's work. Uh, it's just a beautiful, phenomenal piece of work. Uh, I looked at this close when I was at the archives and it just, her lines, there just isn't a mistake or a flaw in it. And she is such of a professional and just so good at what she does. And it's a testament to uh, what Cole Rosie can be. So, uh, next. Okay, now we're going to get into inspiration. This is a box in the archives. I seen this about three years ago, and I fell in love with it, and I thought, well, I'm going to build a box like that and coal rose it. And uh, you can go to the next picture, Josh. This is the other side of the box, and then Josh can show you the top of the box. Okay. Now, this box is, it's trick opening. You gotta pull a lever and pull the box back and flip it open. And it's a, a, probably a shaving box or a candle box. And if it's a candle box, you know, hundreds of years ago, people had to carry their fire with them, carry their light with them. So there's no flashlights and you didn't carry a lantern through the woods. Uh, you know, so, I mean, they just had to carry what they needed. and boxes like this is what they used. Now, this is what it inspired. Next picture. Uh, these are the three boxes that it inspired that I made. Uh, and uh, it just, uh, uh, I just love the way the boxes are. They're very, it's a very tough coal rosing uh, pattern because in the center, you have six lines that meet that if you miss anywhere you have a cut out or a chip out or a, a, and when you're doing curves and lines like this if you're off it's just so noticeable i mean it just it just screams crooked line so uh next now this i don't know uh jennifer do you have any history on this box um, just a just a little bit. It was brought to the United States in the 1860s, but it obviously dates uh, much earlier than that. It's um, supposedly a letter letter box, um, and it's uh, made out of birch. That's about all that we know. Okay, and uh, uh, could uh, as we kind of flip through the pictures, could you maybe tell a little about the symbolism and? maybe what it means, uh, because it's, uh, it's so intriguing, this box is. Uh, you go to the next picture, Josh. I'll also just make a quick note for our viewers. If there's a specific slide that you want to ask a question about later, they're all numbered, so you can write down that number to reference later. Yeah, so this, um, so this box is just full of all kinds of amazing um, designs or decorations and long ago, um, those would be would have been meaningful symbols to to people and a way to communicate certain things. And so um, there's just a variety of sometimes what we call sacred symbols today, but um, like I said, meaningful to folks and a lot of them have to do with protection. Um, a lot of them are to give good luck. Um, some of the symbols are for fertility. And on this one, we have a lot of uh, um, symbols that are for protection 
or that represent perhaps the, the divine. So the front and the back uh, have a lot of um, sun, uh, sun symbols uh, on them. And uh, there are also some zigzags on there for protection. And I think the top is really interesting too. Um, that's, that's another sun, sun symbol there. And the top has, um, it sort of has a cross there, but it also has um, some of the characteristics of a Volcanut, um, which is kind of an, an interesting uh, cross-like shape. And that also for, um, is for protection. Um, so lots of things going on. This is like, this is a letter box, so must have had valuable letters in it that they wanted to protect. <laughs> Uh, yes, this this is also one of my favorite pieces. Uh, it's just uh, there's so much going on with it. it. It makes me wonder if it wasn't a long winter and uh, we just carved and carved and carved, but it uh, or maybe different owners of the box carved different things on it. Uh, it it's just amazing. Uh, next. And I was just going to mention the box is a is a smaller box. It's about um, nine. Uh, nine by six uh, in depth and then six high, six inches high. So it's, it's not a very large box. Now this, uh, what, what intrigued me with this, this piece is uh, the top. If you'd go to the next slide, Josh, there. It's just the, the pattern there. You look at the serpentine weave of the you know, of the V's, if you want to say, like water. And then you have a star symbol of some type in the bottom of the V's. And I look at this and I think, you know, I'm going to do something with that some way, you know, uh, uh, incorporate that into a border on something, because to me, that's, that's just beautiful. It really is. Uh, next picture. Now, this is a mangle board. It has many of the symbols we already just looked at it uh, uh, it's just a beautiful piece and I put it in here just so you know this is a larger piece it's probably five inches by 30 inches in there somewhere uh, and uh, this these weren't easy to make I mean you look at that uh, center carving of it looks like the spoke wheel or the, the spinning sun or the pinwheel uh, I've tried to draw and cut that. Uh, that's a difficult. That's a difficult job. There, it's uh, it's tough to do. Uh, next, all right. This is a, is this a porridge pot, Jennifer? Or uh, yes, yep. It's a it's an ombar uh, for okay. porridge. Okay, and and uh, this is the top of it. And I just I, I like this picture because these lines and these patterns. There's so many. You can put them, make them smaller, make them larger. You can coal rose them. Uh, you could crow them. You could chip carve them. There's just so many directions you could go with it. Uh, next picture. Yeah, this this is this is really a cool piece. This is a powder horn, and uh, uh, the designs are. Uh, I can get a lot of inspiration out of these designs. Something that I might do. But really intrigued me about it is if you look on the uh, V symbol right in there, the V's right there, it never got finished. Or I I would like to see the other side sometime to see if it's what's done on the other side. But like I was telling Jennifer, he maybe he got shot or a bear got him before he got his uh, coal rosing done on this uh, horn or a scrimshaw. It just it was just kind of odd that uh, that wasn't completed. But His wife probably wanted him to finish her project, Scott. Well, that it could have been a hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you never know. <laughs> uh, next, yeah, here, here's a, another powder horn, and I look at this, and what intrigues me is not so much what the uh, the carving or the, the 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 cutting that was done on it; it's what wasn't carved. Because to me, I see a, a smiley face there, uh, two eyes and a smiley face and, and uh, a couple, uh, maybe a couple dragonflies. And uh, it's, it, it shows what, 
there's so much that's carved. It shows what wasn't carved. It really makes it look good. I really enjoy that. Next. All right. Go ahead, Josh. Okay. We're going to get into what I've done. And uh, this is a plate that uh, at the first Cole Rosen class I went to in 2016, Darlene taught it. And she, uh, she emphasized uh, stippling and shading. And uh, so this is my first attempt at uh, doing any shading. And uh, uh, next, please. Okay, here's two beautiful pieces of work. I show these, this isn't mine. Uh, I picked these up, but they're uh, Judy Ridger. And they're of a stave church, and the bottom one is chip carved and uh, coal rosed, and the top one is coal rosed. Uh, the top piece was given to Dell Stubbs by Judy, and then uh, Dell gave it to a benefit auction, and I picked it up there. And it just shows you how you can draw with a knife. That is just beautiful work, and uh, it just looks like it was meant to be on that piece of wood. And it's cut and coal rosed, and uh, it's just, to me, it's just, it, it shows us what coal rosing can be, one avenue it can go. Next. Okay, here I give Christmas tree ornaments every year, and uh, the one on the left is, uh, that's American holly is the wood, and that's a chip carving pattern. My dad had, was a chip carver, so I found some of his patterns, and I made Christmas tree ornaments. Uh, the one on the left is all shaded, stippled, and the one on the right is just cut with a knife. And... Uh, it shows you the versatility, the difference, you know, of uh, what you can do. Uh, uh, the one on the right is basswood. Now, the center, that's a little shrink pot. And uh, it's made out of mulberry. And I just coal rosed it and uh, uh, went from there. Uh, it's uh, just a lot of fun. And uh, to me, my favorite one's a shrink pot because it's it, it's just it wasn't a set pattern. It's just what I wanted to do. Next, yes, uh, this is the wood is mulberry, and I put this in here so you can coal rose with colors. It's uh, it's more work than just using uh, uh, one one color, but you know a dark color, but. This was done with chalk. Uh, some of the chalk was uh, from the lumber yard for chalk lines, and other some of it was from uh, uh, little pieces of chalk you get at the hobby store. Uh, and this is mulberry, and it's pretty dry mulberry because mulberry doesn't bleed the the, the colors in chalk near as much. And you'll find that certain chalks have more dye in them, and the more dye that's in it, uh, the harder it is to work with. Uh, it'll bleed and make a stain more than it'll it'll color the area. And uh, yeah, it, it's I'm surprised the colors have held up. That's about three years old. These colors are so they've they've held up well. Next, okay. Well, there is a shrink pot on the left hand side that is uh i made two of these at yogi sunquist class and this was the second one and yogi he took the first one home so i drink coffee out of it every day and that's uh, kind of shows it uh, the other one is made out of cherry and it is uh an after hours cup or a whiskey cup and it's a lot smaller because i can drink a lot more coffee than i can drink whiskey but anyway, uh, it's uh, the designs are uh, protection symbols. A lot of Sami signs on the cup on the left. Uh, I'm a real fan of those uh, designs. Uh, next, okay, this one. Uh, I really like this style. It's uh, uh, made out of poplar, 
a white poplar, uh, two salt shakers, uh, a uh, toothpick holder and something to hold them in. And the, the Sami designs, I, I just love them because when I was a child, we didn't have TV and we had to entertain each other. And uh, dad had screwed a big blackboard to the back of the house that came out of a school. And for fun, he, would, uh, he was a lover of cave drawings and uh, uh, the Neanderthal. So he would draw pictures and make a picture story. And then he would tell a story and it would stick people and horses and all the stuff. And he would make a story out of it. Well, then when he was done, he had erased that and we had to draw our pictures and make up our story. And it just, uh, these symbols just bring so much of those thoughts back. And uh, uh, I, I really like doing that type of to coal roasting. Next. Now here are four spoons, three mulberry and a cherry. Uh, we have a turkey buzzards stay most of the year around, around our area. So the feathers are turkey buzzard feather, feathers. And uh, uh, the uh, spoon on the right is, uh, that says friendship. It's a friendship spoon. And the cherry one is a gift from uh, Jeff Ward. And it was a... Uh, uh, it's just, uh, it's out of, no, that ain't cherry, that's Osage. That's right. We were trying to see if I could cool rose Osage, and it, it was difficult, but it's really hardwood. So, uh, next. Here's a couple knives, Sami style knives. Uh, uh, a scrimshaw is really tough to do. And this wood here is American holly, and the longer after it's soiled, it just starts resembling bone more the older it gets after you've the oil starts hardening in it. And the one on the right is the one I use every day. The blade is KJ Groven. And the one on the left, uh, I forge that blade and uh, it's uh, I got a blue ribbon on that at, uh, at the exhibition and uh, it's probably going to go to a family member someday. Uh, and it, but I did, it just goes to show you that you you can coal rose that 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 holly and make some really beautiful things. Next, okay, little story behind this one. This is a mango board I made for Marlene. Uh, I presented it to her at the uh, at Vesterheim during the exhibition oh, about three years ago. And uh, we had never been married in a church. We got married by a judge. So, I, and our parents always wanted us to be married in a church, and they all passed away before it happened. So when we were there, I made this for her, and it was in the exhibition. So I presented it to her and asked her to remarry me. And uh, she, uh, of course, said yes. <laughs> Took a chance, but it worked out. Anyway, so... Uh, Three days later at uh, Bethina Church, we had O'Hare's Hostager uh, did the ceremony, and our children and grandchildren were there. So it was a, a pretty precious time, and uh, it was that mango board was a lot of work, but uh, it it it'll be around for a long time. Next, okay, uh, the word and art in. Scandinavian folk art, I see the word, around, you know, written blessings on many items and rose mauling. I, I see words and uh, uh, wor uh, terms of endearment. And there's a beauty of the word and a beauty of the art. And I think with coal rosing, you can put them together real easily. You can put the beauty of the word and art. And uh, this was uh, a Valentine's Day. I gave this to Marlene about three or four years ago. And uh, it was a poem I wrote her back in 2000. And uh, just to share the poem, it says, uh, I should know this by heart, huh? <laughs> Some say love is blind. We do not agree. The hurdles found in true love is all the blind can see. Now, my, my point here is, we have the word, the beauty of the word, and the beauty of the art. 
and we can mesh them with coal rosing. And I, I think that's, that's so valuable. So, next. Okay, there's two pictures left, this one and the next one. This picture shows how intense you can get when you coal rose. There's roughly 300,000 pinholes in each of these boxes. Uh, I'm guessing I had 80 to 100 hours minimum on each box. Uh, it just uh, carving the box and, you know, coal rosing them. Now, that, that was, uh, like I say, you can only coal rose maybe an hour a day because your eyes and your muscles, you know, you just have to be spot on to do it. Then we have the next picture. Five lines is all this is. Five little lines that mean so much. Uh, uh, they send a message. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that uh, we just need to uh, take this where you want to take it and uh, uh, give as many smiles to people as you can through your art. I'm done. That's well, thank, thanks, Scott. We've had a couple of questions that have come uh, in the chat, so I was kind of holding them to the end. So thanks for everybody for their patience with that. But Scott, I'm wondering if you can share what kind of wood you use to construct your boxes. Uh, those were basswood. And, you know, I, I got the wood from uh, Wisconsin. I want to say it was Henneke or Henneker up in northern Wisconsin. Phil Odin, it's, it's like a cousin of Phil's. And, you know, because of their growing season up there, the growth rings are so close together. And it's really, it, it, uh, that's where, that's the wood I used and that's where I got it, so. All right. Also a little bit about uh, your process. So how do you harvest walnut? Um, kind of what time of the year do you sand that to powder? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess when it comes to the black walnut, bark the oldest trees at the bottom of the tree will have the darkest walnut bark so you know uh, trees grow out not up you know so the bark at the bottom of the tree is the oldest bark on that tree uh, and uh the older the tree the older the bark and it seems like that bark gets darker with age so you don't have to pry it off to the quick of the, you just knock some bark off you, you feel the tree, you can find where, you know, you can loosen up a chunk and do it. And then I just take 100 grit sandpaper and make powder out of it. Uh, and you'll notice that sometimes the bark is uh, to the air and that bark will uh, be darker. And you'll see the differences in it, but you know, I think it all is about as dark as the rest. It just makes me feel better knowing that I got a darker bark, <laughs> so. <laughs> Can you, can you talk a little bit about how you um, create your patterns? So do you use stencils? Uh, do you draw I, on the box? How does that work? You no, know, that, that box, I drew the pattern. And of course, if it, on the boxes, it's the same design over. So, you know, I got one pattern drawn. And when I draw a pattern, I draw it big. Okay, um, maybe that, that pattern was probably six inches when I drew it for that box for just one of the segments. And I use a real fine pencil because the wider your line are, the bigger mistake you're gonna make, uh, uh, the bigger mistake you're gonna make in coal roading. Uh, it's kind of like driving down a highway or walking down a path. And uh, so, I draw a big pattern with a fine uh, lead, uh, fine lead, and then I shrink that pattern, which makes it even a finer line. Okay, and then I will take a toner copier, not inkjet, and make a copy of it, and make a copy of it, make a copy, you know, so I can like put three of them together, just like it is on top of the box, and then. I transfer the pattern, I get it the right size to match the dimensions of the box, which there's a lot of time just, you know, shrinking and expanding and practicing. But then I take heat, heat transfer tool. Uh, they use them for uh, uh, chip carving. It's just, 
I have one here somewhere, but uh, it, you know, I transfer it over with heat. I get a solid on the piece of wood and I use heat transfer tool to transfer it over to the wood. You know, a lot of times I can freehand stuff, but this work, there's no way. It, it, it just has to be, you know, uh, very fine. Scott, could you could you show us again some of your hand, the, the handmade tools, either ones okay, that, you, sure. that you've made or that others have made for you? I think people would be very interested in um, what they what they look like and maybe even how they function for you. Okay, just a second here. All right. Okay. Uh, how well? I got to figure out where my camera's at here. Okay. Can you see the end of that very well, or? A little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, what I basically do is I embed needles in tool handles. Uh, man, there we go, okay. Uh, and uh, I make the handles and embed needles, and I have made hundreds of these that, I, that are no good, or they just don't make a, a design like I want. But uh, I do that. And here, a year or so ago, I started doing, making some that had curves in them, okay. And what this is really nice to do is, is here is a, okay, there's three feathers there. You can uh, make feathers real easily with, uh, you know, if you can repeat the pattern with the needles and, uh, it's just a lot, it, it just makes it easier. You don't have to, you know, you got 20 needles, you push it in once instead of 20 times. So it really helps that way. And uh, I've done, there's, well, there's, here's one that's a triangle. Those are, uh, those are uh, uh, tattoo needles. They don't work very well. Uh, they, uh, they awful fragile, they tend to bend. And, and here's another one. And uh, uh, they're, uh, they're just another tool to use that, that uh, gives you a little different dimension. But as far as the ones I use the most, by far, this one here, it's about not quite a quarter inch wide and it probably has 20 needles in it. And I use it to shade and it does 90% of what I do, 95%, that's it. And on the other end, I got, you know, a little smaller to get into the smaller spots. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, yeah, and here's, here's a cold rosy knife I made. I think that's one of KJ's blades, uh, chip carving blade, but I use it to cold rose with. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a lot of fun, and you you learn. Uh, you can also I don't have them right here, but you can use uh, uh, cable ties. Okay, when you take a cable tie, a real small cable tie, and you have needles embedded in something that ain't glued yet, and you take a cable tie, it makes a teardrop pattern, and like that, and then everything dries up and you've got a, a teardrop pattern. You know, there's a lot of things you can do that way. But uh, it just depends how far you want to take it. But it's, uh, it's a lot of fun experimenting with. And I, I do what I call skull doodling or cold doodling. You know, here's, that's just a chicken. And here's a, uh, this is kind of, this was a, uh, a, uh, uh, a, 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 uh, rose modeling pattern and uh, it was at Darlene's class and I thought well I'll just make a troll out of it and uh, so now it's a troll but uh, they're, they're, all those things just just have fun with it and uh, it's cheap fun uh, these pieces of wood I just sawed off of a piece that was beside the shed you know and in grain when you cold rose in grain the bleeding in the wood goes into the wood. It doesn't go out away from the, what you're doing. So it really, it's really easy to cold rose into grain, where on the edge it'll bleed out from where you cut. So anyway, 